Hey everyone, Julie here with Equip the Light, where we equip you with the knowledge of Jesus and His Word so that you can know Him and walk in the calling that He has for you. Today I'm going to give you an introduction to the Gospel of John, which will give you the historical and cultural background and sort of set up your understanding of what this book is about. So when we first approach a book, we want to find out who is the author, when was it written, and what is the cultural and historical background that we know so that we can get a better understanding of what the author and what God intended to us as readers. So John is the fourth and the last gospel in the New Testament. It's written around AD 85, and it's a reflective account from John. So the author is John, the son of Zebedee. He's one of the 12 disciples. Interesting enough, John's mother, Salome, or Salome, not Salome, was a follower of Jesus and part of a group of women that both witnessed Jesus' death and also came to Jesus' tomb on the third day, bringing burial spices. Some scholars speculate Salome was a sister of Mary, Jesus' mother, and therefore that John was a cousin of Jesus. Salome, the mother of John, should not be confused with Salome, Herodias' daughter, in Mark 6.22. Prior to meeting Jesus, John was a disciple of John the Baptist, who had been preaching repentance of sins and had been prophesying that the time of the Messiah was now. But John the Baptist was not the only one expecting the Messiah at that time. The Jewish religious leaders and everyone else in the Jewish community knew that the Messiah was expected at that time because of the calculations from the Old Testament prophecies. When John the Baptist revealed that Jesus was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, John and Andrew immediately received that witness and followed Jesus. John didn't start out as a loving and contemplative person as shown in his writings. Jesus nicknamed John and his brother James the Sons of Thunder, likely a term of endearment for the dynamic duo and arguably the first superhero name Jesus gave anyone when people were unwelcoming to Jesus on Samaria. The sons of thunder asked Jesus if they could call down fire from heaven to consume the unbelievers. Jesus rebuked them, saying, The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. On another occasion, just after Jesus told the disciples about his impending death and resurrection, the brothers insensitively asked Jesus to grant them the right to sit on his left and right which greatly annoyed the other disciples. Jesus told them that this was not his to give and reserved for others. He told the disciples that the greatest must first be a slave or servant of all, and that even he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. But in the years following Jesus' time on earth, John's writings indicate that his life had been completely transformed. The event of the resurrection of Jesus was a missing puzzle piece that suddenly unlocked the meaning of Jesus' life and his teachings. Through reflection of his time with Jesus and what Jesus said and did, John finally understood the love of Christ and the significance of who Jesus was and what his sacrificial death meant for believers, eternal life. John's character was completely transformed and he became known as the Apostle of Love. By the time he wrote the Gospel of John, out of humility, and yet as a statement to bolster his eyewitness account of Jesus, John would only identify himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He played an important role in the spread of the Gospel and the early church's growth, spending much of his life in Ephesus and the surrounding area of Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey. He is believed to be the only disciple who was not martyred, but he nonetheless lived in a time when persecution of Christians was lawful. He suffered persecution and was exiled to the island of Patmos, where he had a heavenly encounter with Jesus and wrote the book of Revelation around AD 95, the final message Christ gave to the church. He was later brought to Ephesus for two years before he died in peace. Historical contemporaries note John's message was simplified into a single command, children love one another. John is also the author of the epistles of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now for the historical and cultural background of this book. By the time the book of John was written, several decades after Jesus' ascension to heaven, the good news of Jesus as Messiah had been spreading to Jews and Gentiles far and wide. Many had likely heard that Jesus was a Jew from Nazareth claiming to be the promised Messiah, 
who had died and whose disciples claimed he came back to life and then returned to heaven. Many believed in Jesus as their savior upon hearing this witness. But due to a lack of knowledge about Jesus and his teachings and the influx of new popular Greek philosophies, some people had difficulty understanding this new message of eternal life. Whether they were a Jew or a Gentile, people were born into religions steeped in cultural and economic traditions. If they were Jewish, they had been taught that there is only one God who had existed from the beginning of creation. If they were Gentiles, they had their own array of pagan religions, which had to do more with economic connections and ruling authorities' pressure than anything else. Due to new false heresies in the guise of apostolic teachings such as Gnosticism, which denied the humanity of Jesus and therefore his atonement for sin, conspiracies about Jesus began to fly, shaking both the faith of some believers and their witness to unbelievers. People had questions and confusion about Jesus' life and teachings at that time. Was Jesus fully God, fully man, or both? Was he just an apparition and not really human? Even today, we hear deceived and unknowledgeable people attempt to claim Jesus didn't really exist or that he really didn't die on the cross. But John had lived and breathed and walked with Jesus. John had leaned his head back on Jesus' bosom at the Last Supper to ask him who would betray him and was served breakfast by him on the shore after Jesus' resurrection. Moreover, Jesus' teachings and words were spiritual life. The truth of the person of Jesus who he was, what he did and said, and what it meant for humanity needed to be made clear. John declared himself to be a first account witness, providing direct testimony rather than circumstantial evidence, stating, this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things and we will know that his testimony is true. So why did John write this book? He actually says it plainly, in John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, which states, Therefore, many other signs or testing miracles Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the book of John is broken up into two main sections. There's John chapters 1 through 11 and John chapters 12 through 21. The first half describes his public ministry, and the second half describing his private ministry to his disciples and to those who would believe in him as a result. So what John does in John, he sets the record straight about who Jesus is and what he means for humanity. John shows us that Jesus was not only the Messiah fulfilled as the Son of God, but that Jesus also revealed himself as a loving Savior who paid a price for humanity's reconciliation with God. In Jesus is everything we need, the Word, the Light, the Gate, the Shepherd, the Servant, the Bread, the Source of Living Water, the Vine, Salvation, Redemption, etc. He is our life. He is our victory. He is everything we need. He is the Great I Am living in us right now. His divine powers granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. As we explore Jesus' life, teachings, and identities, we will gain a greater understanding of who Jesus is in relation to us and how we can abide in him on a daily basis to bear spiritual fruit that will last. In John, Jesus is crying to the thirsty, come to me. Now, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. In the midst of a crowd of people with plenty of food and drink around for the religious feast, there stood Jesus crying out to all who would hear his voice, come to me and drink. Jesus was telling everyone that he was the source of living water. He was the source of eternal life. Today, the same cry calls out to us, every day and every moment offering us his living water. Are you thirsty? Are you hungry? Jesus was not talking about a hunger or thirst in your physical body. He was identifying a spiritual thirst, a spiritual hunger in your spirit. Every human on earth was designed to have a close relationship with God. 
Many seek to fill this spiritual hole with things, relationships, and human goals or accomplishments, but they will never be satisfied until they find Jesus, the only one who can give living water and spiritual bread. As believers in Jesus, we know we need Jesus. But with the distractions of life, we can easily neglect the one who lives inside of us. Some may have become lukewarm, tempered by the world and the cares of this life. Some have even forgotten their first love, Jesus. Perhaps their understanding of Jesus has become fuzzy. Some never took the time to get to know him. The point of salvation is the beginning of a promise to life in him, not the end. To the new believers and to the seasoned ones, to the young and to the old, and to everyone in between, Jesus is crying out to his sheep to come to him and follow his voice. If you follow Jesus, he will lead you to the living waters and the living bread. Jesus stated, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Eternal life does not begin when you die but it begins the moment you believe in Jesus and turn your life to follow him. When you receive Jesus, his promised Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of you. This promise of a growing, thriving, and having a well-watered spiritual life is for the now, in this lifetime. You can thrive on Jesus' life now. You can have him now. He calls you friend. He calls you his. He calls you now. And yet Jesus is so much more than what we realize. We were created to have so close a relationship with God that the Spirit of Jesus, who is the person of the Holy Spirit, would make his dwelling place in us. We can have access to Jesus, we can have access to God and the Holy Spirit all the time in this life. In every moment, in the good, the bad, and the very ugly, we get him. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus or maybe you walked away and you want to start a new relationship with him. Receive him today and be reconciled to God. He loves you and he has great plans for your life. Through Jesus, you will receive eternal salvation and he will come and make his home inside of you. And you don't have to fear death because God promises to be with you until you meet him face to face. So if you want to get right with God and you're serious, say this prayer out loud right now. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for sinning against you. I repent and turn away from my old way of life and living according to my own will. Wash me, cleanse me, and set me free from every stronghold in my life. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. I receive your Holy Spirit right now. Let me follow you and your word all the days of my life until I meet you face to face. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you said that prayer, congratulations, you're part of God's family. This is the beginning of a new great adventure with God. I'd love to help you grow spiritually. First check out our Foundation in Jesus series in the links below, and then join me on a Bible study about life of Jesus in the Gospel of John, where you'll learn who Jesus is to you and who you are in Him. Equip the Light wants to equip you with the knowledge of Jesus and His Word so that you can know Him and step into the calling that He's called you to. If you like this video, please subscribe and hit the like button. Thanks everyone! I've got big news. My book, The Unlocking, is out and available for purchase. It's an action-adventure fantasy novel about the end of the world through the eyes of an 11-year-old girl. It's funny, exciting, and you won't want to put it down. Enjoy! Okay, so I think that is okay. Not stop there. Whew.